China has banned Bitcoin three or four times. How many more times can you ban it? Chinese people are still buying quite significant volumes and that volume has been increasing since 2021. Who is the next billion? The easiest next billion is Chinese people. Like the Western mind cannot comprehend how hustly Chinese entrepreneurs are. Even with a government like China that has been so technologically advanced in terms of its surveillance state and its capability, it's not able to shut down Bitcoin. It's not able to shut down the ability to people to buy and to transact. Bitcoin is a superior form of saving your wealth and it gets rid of all these restrictions. By using Bitcoin, you're exiting the system. That's the thing the Chinese Communist Party fears the most because it needs to control that system of capital flight because of two too much capital leaves at once, then China's whole system kind of starts buckling under a little bit. Like you're going to see some countries aggressively embrace Bitcoin with the strategic reserve or they'll mine it themselves. What's the next country that's going to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender? Like, what, what do you think is the current situation actually in China around Bitcoin? Like, what, like there's so many confusing things coming out. Like, it, it is, it, there's yeah. mining going on, but it's kind of banned. Like, the, like the, there's so much what I hear with, with China and the only information that I always have, they were the first nation to try really to uh, ban it and stuff like that. So what's, what's the actual reality right now uh, around Bitcoin in, in China? Yeah, I, it's like, a, it's a great question. People usually ask me that first off, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion around like the bans and stuff like that. It seems like China has banned Bitcoin like three or four times. How many more times can you ban it? <laughs> But, um, you know, uh, I think Chinese people are very much part of the conversation. Um, you know, Robin, we met at Bitcoin Amsterdam. And you probably saw that there were a lot of uh, Chinese entrepreneurs and business people involved at all levels, right? I mean, of course, with the mining and of course, with providing like mining chips uh, and ASICs and stuff like that. But also like, you know, you see them, you see Chinese entrepreneurs kind of working in like layer twos. Um, you know, there's developers that work for like prominent Bitcoin companies and stuff like that. So definitely a huge part of the ecosystem. Um, from what I've heard, even though there is kind of like... Um, a mining ban of sorts. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, there are still miners in China. I think I've talked to a couple of people who have indicated to me, I don't have like final, final confirmation, but like there's still some mining going on in Xinjiang, for example, like on a pretty systematic basis. Apparently it never really was shut down. And there seems to be Bitcoin miners that are, you know, still operating uh, within China. Um, to give you a quick example, I know Daniel Batten had a report out with Bitcoin Magazine um, and, um, there are some things there to discuss, but they did get like three or four sources, uh, that, uh, talked about Bitcoin mining in China, despite the ban. Um, and the other part of that is like, there's actually a Chinese, a senior communist party official in Fuzhou, uh, which is actually my, um, I was born there, but anyways, <laughs> um, he got arrested for, uh, still promoting Bitcoin mining, even after, you know, Liu He and the kind of moratorium was established on new mining sites. So there seems to be still like active mining. It probably, if I were to guess, like some private mining, uh, private mining with, when it comes to like private power companies or maybe local governments, China has, is a little bit of like in an economic downturn. One of the consequences of that is that the local governments don't have uh, a lot of tax revenue. Um, and so there's a lot of incentive if you have like stranded power and things like that to work through that. Um, now all the other, you know, I mean, you know, from what I've heard, uh, Bitmain and other companies, they've moved a lot of their manufacturing chain out of China. Um, even though they're Chinese based companies, there are, uh, Trump, well, Trump imposed these like tariffs and Biden actually like made them higher. So if you're, if you create like Chinese made goods, including Chinese made semiconductors and Chinese made computer chips, which A6 would fall under, um, there's like strong incentives to manufacture them in countries outside of China now. So that, that is one thing that's happening. And then the thing that people always ask me is like, well, do people still buy Bitcoin in China? Right? Like, is that, you know, like, are they still part of the price story? Um, and, uh, in many ways, yes, I think the most, so I'm, uh, I'm working, I can kind of say I'm that I'm working on more qualitative research because it's really hard to do quantitative research um, because there is no public uh, yuan to Bitcoin pairing because there is uh, an exchange ban. So technically the exchanges should not serve Chinese based people. Now, 
China based people uh, that are Chinese citizens. Now, um, I have talked with a few people and uh, if you have Chinese uh, citizenship and Chinese identity documents, but you put your address outside of China, those exchanges will still serve you. So there's that. And then there's a, a bunch of different ways people can get involved. Like in general, um, it, it's basically over the counter trading. Mm, like there isn't like a public ledger because if there was a public ledger and someone acknowledged that they were taking yuan for Bitcoin or yuan for Tether, as is the case for most people, actually, um, then that would be illegal <laughs> um, for that service. Right. So it's hard to get like concrete, concrete numbers. The closest thing you have from like a quantitative perspective is chain analysis does a report. They track like several Chinese OTC desks. So. Uh, some of it is like knowing which addresses are associated with the OTC desks that are folded within traditional exchanges. So say, for example, you can imagine like a Binance, right? Binance has like an OTC division as well. Some of it is also just knowing, you know, having relationships with the OTC desks. I've interviewed some of the OTC desks, but not in a systematic way like chain analysis does. So they have this um, report. I can share it with you after um, the the conversation, but basically it just shows that the number of inflows has been steadily increasing in terms of China-based interest from OTC desks. So I think, um, let me just actually look at it right now because I have it in front of me or I had it in front of me. Let me just take a quick look. Uh, sorry, okay, here it is. So they have like this thing, it's like total value received by select China-based OTCs. And you see in 2021, it was like about $5 billion or six or seven, give or take. And now uh, per quarter, um, and now we're in Q2 2024, the latest that they released the stats, and it's about like 21 or, or you know, 22 or 23 billion dollars. And that's like a lower bound because they don't, like I actually talked to the chain analysis team and they don't actually track every, I mean, you can't, right? Like there's probably like a million ways people are buying Bitcoin, uh, maybe not a million, but like a lot of ways that people are buying Bitcoin that you just can't quite record. But from what we're seeing, um, there's a very clean and simple story, which is that uh, this economy is doing pretty badly right now. There's like pretty high youth unemployment rate. Um, and also, you know, if you're invested in Chinese stocks or you're invested in Chinese real estate, those have been going declining in value quite significantly. Uh, some people have lost, you know, I've seen 60% loss on their stock portfolio, right? Or like 30% loss on like real estate if you bought in um, one of the top cities in China. Um, so there's a strong incentive now for people to get their money out of the system. Because in China, there's not really like a way to make, there's not like rapid inflation or anything. It's actually more deflationary right now. Uh, although the way China measures inflation, I mean, as with all things, you know, all Chinese metrics, beware. But um, it seems like the problem is more that people can't make uh, money, not, not necessarily in the base currency, but the base currency, Chinese people save a lot. And then all the assets that they're saving in, there's like destruction of wealth, like massive, massive destruction of wealth. Um, and so, you know, how to get people out. And it seems to be the case that since China's economy has struggled, not only has there been mo more monetary stimulus, which you probably heard about and we can talk a little bit more, but also we are seeing, um, you know, more and more through all the quantitative stats that we can see interest in Bitcoin from China and, and that Chinese people are still buying quite significant volumes. And that volume has been increasing since 2021, which is kind of when the bans kind of kicked in. And I actually recently, I would say they're close to highs or all time highs. Bloomberg came out with like a report based off of the chain analysis research that was saying that, you know, Chinese people are buying in. So Chinese people are still a very big part of the story. I think they're the easiest, you know, how people, us Bitcoiners are always talking about like, who is the next billion? Um, the easiest next billion is Chinese people, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, they are one of the groups that, that need it the most. And it's interesting, if I understand it correct, government is banning Bitcoin exchanges and Bitcoin miners, and therefore also by um, banning, are they also banning the Bitcoin trade? Like you cannot trade with Bitcoin there or like the everything that is Bitcoin touching, they, they are banning. Is, is that right? Um, so yeah, this is where we want to get into a little bit of detail. So first thing is that, you know, Hong Kong and China are separate 
And Hong Kong has a very robust, like, so you, you will have the ability to transact Bitcoin with OTC desks. Um, there, there is something in Hong Kong law. I mean, who knows if this will stay forever <laughs> because, you know, China has changed a lot of things with Hong Kong, a little bit off topic for this podcast, but that's, that's its own other rabbit hole. But, um, Ch uh, Hong Kong has this thing called the basic law, which is kind of like their constitution of sorts. And so, uh, that's why in Hong Kong, you know, there's the regulated exchanges, uh, and, and I don't think there will ever not be an ability, at least for the next few years to not trade Bitcoin for Hong Kong dollars. So the Hong Kong dollar is pretty convertible to Bitcoin. And in Hong Kong right now, what's actually interesting is even in addition to the regulated exchanges being allowed in Hong Kong, and of course they have the spot ETF and the futures ETF and things like that. Um, there also are a lot of, um, I went to one last time I was in Hong Kong. There are like these physical cash shops um, and they're much, much better rates. Um, I think like when I was there, it was like, uh, don't quote me on this, it's like 2.5 or 3%. So it's much lower than a Bitcoin ATM. So you can go and you can get, yeah. And that still exists. They're kind of currently trading under like a peer to peer exemption. Um, and so a lot of people, I, I've had a few friends, there's actually like a mall in Hong Kong, where there's like a bunch of these shops and they transact in lightning, which is also really cool. So you can go, you can bring your sats on lightning. You can work directly with that person. Um, cause even in like other places like Turkey or, or other places I've been to the OTC decks, they're mostly on Binance, right? Uh, I guess Binance has enabled lightning recently, but, um, typically they use on chain. So you would use on chain or you use USDT and, uh, apparently the Hong Kong area. So there's, there's like quite a sophisticated trading environment in Hong Kong. And so far, even though technically the peer to peer trade and the over the counter trading, well, the over the counter trade ding or the cash shops might become illegal because Hong Kong just wants to do regulated exchanges. Um, but, um, they peer to peer trade is an exemption in Hong Kong. So just. If you want one takeaway from everything I just said, Hong Kong different from China, and then there is quite a bit of a robust trading ecosystem in Hong Kong. Um, though, um, you know, one other thing to know about Hong Kong is it's very like Web3 based. Um, so there's a lot of other crypto. So a lot of these cash shops I mentioned to you, they made a lot of money on like Solana, ETH or like whatever. So they're not necessarily like Bitcoin only. And they also trade a lot with Tether. Um, China itself, like, mainland China. Um, so just the difference, I mean, mainland China is basically like all the regions outside of like Hong Kong, Macau, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I think mainland China is probably what people think of when they think of China per se. Um, and, uh, the thing with mainland China is like, you know, um, yeah, like it, it's similar to the VPN ban. Meaning like if you're an individual trying to get across the VPN ban in China, there's so many people that use VPNs, by the way, like they're all over the, the, like, um, it's called like flipping the great firewall. Like a lot of people do that. You know, I, I, I don't know exactly how many, but if I were to like quickly estimate it, it's definitely millions of people. Right. Um, and it's kind of a similar dynamic. So if you are a company providing VPNs, to Chinese people, that is like a pretty big risk. They will go after you, your assets, they'll try to jail you. So similar to that, if you're like an OTC broker, like they jailed the quote unquote crypto king of China, right? Cause this guy was talking loud. He was trading a lot. He was selling a lot and buying a lot in bulk, right? So people like that, that's like multi-year jail sentences. That's like, you know, they really go to crack down hard on you. Um, in terms of like individuals, there have been cases, but uh, yeah, it's not as like systematic, like in the sense of like people still do trade peer to peer, right? They also trade a lot with the over the counter trading. It's kind of a gray zone, right? Like you shouldn't be doing it as an individual. There have been people that have been arrested for trading um, more tether than Bitcoin. Um, that's also another thing. A lot of Chinese people usually buy tether versus like Bitcoin itself, but um, the uh, actual number of arrests there is usually quite, if you're not doing things in addition to that, I've seen like six months jail sentences, but it's not like a systematic thing. Like there's no way they're imprisoning everyone that's like buying and selling Bitcoin. We just talked about how maybe there's like $20 billion in 
trading volume per quarter in inflows to OTC desks, right? And I've seen like maybe like a few thousand people be arrested. I'm not saying that's a small amount, and I'm still saying that's like kind of a big deal. Um, but it's definitely not like anywhere close, I think, to like the volume of people who actually are trading in these things. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a gray zone. Um, you know, if you do get caught, there is a chance your account gets frozen. Um, that's actually been a thing I've seen where like uh, some of the exchanges, especially the ones with like Chinese background, like they used to be in China and then they left. I think they still kind of cooperate with uh, the Chinese authorities. Like the Chinese authorities cite them in cases where they've made arrests. Um, and I know one or two anecdotes that have been told to me of like the exchanges freezing accounts um, that belong to certain people. But I mean, obviously, and this is the beauty of Bitcoin, right? Like if you're trading peer to peer and you're like kind of like, hey, let's meet in a in a group or whatever, you can't really stop that. And then if you're trading over the counter, um, the typically the broker is taking all the risk, but you as a buyer don't necessarily take that much risk, if that makes sense. I really quickly, because I am really aware always that there might be someone in that is kind of now, what is over the counter? <laughs> so like, can, can you quickly explain like what is over the counter trading? Like what does that oh, yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I uh, good check. Um, so, I mean, obviously, most people, um, you know, when they deal with Bitcoin, I would say there's kind of like three main ways that people get Bitcoin, right? One main way is through exchanges. So you do you go in, you KYC, uh, then you kind of uh, go and purchase um, Bitcoin that way, right? Like if you sign up for Coinbase or in Europe, it might be like Relay or I don't know what, right? Like, but there's all these different kinds of exchanges. Uh, Chinese people in that sense, they kind of can put a fake address or they can put an address they own outside. And so they can still kind of trade in that way. The other way is peer to peer, right? That's like you go uh, to like a laundromat, you go to like somewhere, you just like meet up or you go to meetups and you're just like, hey, here's some cash. Okay, here's some sats. Give me a receiving address and you send it. Over the counter is kind of typically it's for more private transactions because the exchanges, the, the throughput on there is um, more or less public because most people are able to trace the exchange addresses. And so if you're making market moving amounts of uh, money, then you have an incentive to use the over the counter trading desk because these are kind of like private arrangements. They kind of on uh, the chain look like, I mean, they look like large transactions of which we don't know the origin of basically, right? Um, but the OTC desk work pretty similar to like, I I've written a couple articles about it. They kind of work like private banking in a way. Um, and so you go, like basically you go to the spot and they usually have physical spots, but sometimes it's online. And then you say like, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin on bulk. And they have their requirements. They do their own whatever documentation and stuff like that. And then once you're in, they're like buying on your behalf, basically. Um, now, the reason why Chinese people would use over the counter over exchanges is because, again, exchanges don't really, um, you know, uh, operate uh, in China to that degree. I think if you're buying really large amounts, that becomes like kind of an issue. You want kind of like that privacy and then the over-the-counter desks, depending on, I mean, obviously for me, I'm like a writer and a, a journalist. So when I ever have asked people, they've always been like, they're never going to be like, oh, we take money from China, you know, or you know what I'm saying. But in theory, I mean, you could hypothesize, I, mean, I think it's happening. And based off of the chain analysis figures, like you could, if you're like an OTC desk and you're based out of like not China, right? Maybe you're in Singapore, maybe you're somewhere else, right? And you you're just buying on behalf of someone else, right? And maybe they have uh, bank reserves outside of China, or maybe they have, there is um, a system to route payments within China and then for you to get USDT or Bitcoin out. That is kind of like the riskiest of what we call the over-the-counter trading uh, departments. And typically uh, why it is that way is because the exchanges, the Bitcoin exchanges like Binance, OKX, Huobi, they refuse to take the risk. Um, so the risk in China is that it's illegal. Uh, it's, it's basically like if you work for an over-the-counter trading desk that's doing a lot of sales, even if you're abroad, 
China's government has threatened to arrest and has arrested some of those people. So even if you're like abroad and you're working an OTC desk and you are knowingly uh, accepting Chinese yuan in order to get like Bitcoin or Tether, there is um, that kind of a system where, um, you know, uh, there's these kind of like merchants, they deposit collateral into like Binance or Huobi, and then they're discoverable on Binance and Huobi, but Binance isn't really doing that. And I mean that in the sense of over the counter in that that is one, um, it's not like through the exchange. It's like you actually are dealing with kind of like a private relationship, but it's mediated by the exchanges, if that makes sense. So hopefully that helps. I mean, if it, uh, the over the counter trading, like I would think about it, like um, exchanges are like banks, um, but I'm just making this as an example. Um, and over the counter trading desks are kind of like, you know how like, there's private banking or like there's kind of hedge funds or things like that. That's kind of like what that is. It, it's super interesting when you look at the conversation because like I have in Austria this orange pilling conversations with people that are complete normies that are like, I don't know, like from a good friend, their uncle or something like that. And then there's like a message like, Hey, do, do you want to talk with him about Bitcoin? And like, Hey, let, okay, let's set up a quick, uh, video call. And there I see kind of like what the absolute normies, uh, think about Bitcoin and what their concerns are with Bitcoin, even if they are interested in. And one question that comes up since the last like four years or five years that I do that is like, will the uh, EU ban it? Will America ban it? Will people like, will it be banned? Am I yeah. follow? And, and that's in Austria. Like we, we have Bitcoin only exchanges. We have a, a like yeah. a, a economy here. It's regulated. Uh, the politicians acknowledges like nobody's pushing against Bitcoin in Austria in a big way, anything like that. So, uh, Bitcoin is a normal thing here in Austria, but still people are afraid uh, of it mm -hmm. because there are some talks. And this is where I imagine when the same thing is happening in China, where you actually have these cases of people getting arrested for buying Bitcoin, for people actually um, having that fear of like, oh, like, I don't want to be on the bad side of the government. I guess adoption is really hard uh, in, in China um, and like really getting the ball rolling uh, for that. Obviously, you cannot stop it because people uh, will still uh, educate themselves and they have access to, to that education and they also can access Bitcoin, as you just explained. But I guess the, the, the adoption is, is, uh, is kind of difficult, which leads me up to my next question. How do you think Bitcoin will... Uh, in impact China long term, and maybe let's stay with uh, mainland China, as you said. Hong Kong is, is yeah. quite different. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, great question. Um, I mean, first off, I want to say one thing about why I wrote the book, um, and so it is kind of to uh, reassure some of these U.S. people and some of the European people you were mentioning, uh, because China has tried, I think, one of the strongest versions of trying to ban Bitcoin, right? And so. Uh, people should rest assured, even though there was so much Bitcoin mining in the hash rate. And remember, back in the 2020, you know, the FUD was the other way. Like Ripple CEO was saying, like, Bitcoin was controlled by China. And like, if China does anything, then Bitcoin's going to die. Right. And we we saw what happened. I mean, the hash rate went down a little bit. Uh, it howled for quite a bit of time. I shouldn't say a little bit. But then, you know, we were way past recovery at this point, both from a price level, from like a activity and metrics and things like that. So there is an article I wrote, uh, I have this site called chinabitcoinbook.com. Uh, Guy Swan actually did a, he did a narration of it. And the idea was like, you can't really ban Bitcoin. Like a government can't really fully ban Bitcoin or a government will refuse to take most of the steps. And I have to say that China has uh, not necessarily done like everything they possibly could um, but at the same time, they've done a lot of really big things that you would expect other countries to follow. Like the mining ban, I think, is something that like the European Union is looking at very seriously. Right. Um, or I've heard. I mean, I, I, I don't know about that in as much detail, but I've definitely heard of things like, for example, New York State. There was kind of like some policy being considered, et cetera. Um, so. The thing with that is that like even with a government like China that has um, 
you know, been so uh, technologically advanced in terms of its surveillance state and its capability, it's not able to shut down Bitcoin. It's not able to shut down the ability to people to buy and to transact. Um, and not only that, it doesn't even seem to have really dampened the interest. Because now, as we were just talking about, the interest in China seems to be at least two or three X what it used to be, even, you know, during the time of the bans. Um, now, there was some uh, demand or volume that went down, according to chain analysis, um, around that time. But it seems like now we're looking at all time highs and like recovery and things like that. So um, even though adoption is so difficult in a context like China, there are so many strong drivers that people are willing to go out and be a part of the ecosystem anyways. Not only in terms of, um, what I found really interesting is not only in terms of the price. I mean, obviously the price is a big deal. I would say my rough estimate is that like 99% of the people are in it for the money at this point, right? And that's why, you know, sometimes they they do shit coining. Sometimes they, you know, they're on tether. They, they do tokens, they do whatever. Um, you know, but, um, what I would also say about that is like, there seems to be kind of that educational component coming into, I actually, yesterday I had an interview. It's almost like the reverse. I had an interview with, uh, someone who, um, knows quite a bit about Bitcoin, but is like more of a China commentator. Right. Um, and then now we're here and I, and Robin, I think in some of your questions, you know, somewhat about China, but obviously like you're really big on the Bitcoin space. Right. But what I, what, I, I, I yeah. presume I know almost nothing about China. <laughs> okay, all right, fine. Well, you, 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 you know almost nothing about China. All right, that's fine. Um, but uh, okay, but um, basically, uh, right now, what's what what is happening is that you will see uh, people. You know, I was talking to him, and he's like, "Oh, my audience thinks like Bitcoin is a little bit of a scam, and like this and that." You know, there's a lot of those kind of curves uh, when that comes to the discussion. But a lot of people are in it. They're trading, they're buying, they're doing like more of the price. And then the coolest thing is there's this like smaller portion, but like they're on Noster, they're on like these different places, and these are true cypherpunks. And that is very cool to think about, like people who are. Uh, able to be inspired, not just by Bitcoin's price. And actually they're very similar to, you know, I think some Bitcoiners, uh, obviously the price is very important, but then also just like thinking about the self custody element, thinking about, you know, the privacy element and thinking about these kind of things. Like I've seen on Noster people do education on like, here's how you bypass like the, the ban on Telegram. China has like this thing where Telegram won't work unless you have a VPN. Um, and most people will get on Telegram to like interact uh, in the uh, quote unquote crypto community in China. Um, so you start to see things like that. You start to see Bitcoin maxis uh, and people who are actually teaching people like, hey, like it's not just about the price of like X, Y, Z, Dogecoin or like whatever. Um, it's also about like what it means, you know, like to have custody over your own funds, to have access, to be able to transact in the way that you choose in a privacy setting that you might choose as well. And I think for for a country like China, this is like a little bit easier right now to, to understand because um, I was actually talking to uh, Will uh, from Domus who created the, the Nostra app, Domus. And we were actually both talking about this. Like for most people, when you're in the in-between state, you can kind of like, as long as access is not denied to you, that's when people get really mad. So like when you're buying Bitcoin in Canada or in the United States or in Europe, right? Like, um, you know, some people might get a little bit frustrated about the fact that um, you can or, or can't buy at certain amounts without like certain documents or things like that, right? But the truth is, is like you can still, as of now, buy uh, Bitcoin in many different ways, right? Across Europe, across all these different places. Um, in China though, you, you like hit like these like walls, like from a user experience standpoint, it's just like, you can't actually access these things. Like literally you go to the app store, you can't find an app or literally you go to an exchange and it says like, well, you look like you're in China and we refuse to serve like Chinese customers. Right. Uh, but that's not true of just like, Phoenix or whatever, if you're thinking about the States, that's true of like 
pretty much almost every service that exists. So it becomes like a technical block, right? And then that's where like the adoption is a struggle, but I almost point to China as like a positive example of like when the incentives are so strong, right? And I think what will end up happening is if Europe and the United States do something similar to China and they try to block people from making their own financial decisions, they try to block people from accessing Bitcoin, you're going to see uh, a similar kind of um, surge of demand from people who are uh, feel like they're missing out from the opportunity of saving in a true appreciating store of value. Uh, and I think you're going to see people like realize the importance of it, kind of like how, you know, when Twitter was down in or X was down in Brazil, people had no choice. So then they started thinking about like those different options, if that makes sense. So now I think the struggle a little bit, I found, because I also grew up in Canada, like I find the struggle is more like there um, seem to be a lot of options. Like there isn't like a full block. Like, yeah, if you put that you're buying Bitcoin in your bank transfers, the, your bank will probably stop you or you might get debanked. Right. And then that's like a thing that like quite a few people have faced uh, in Canada. We had the trucker protests. And like, obviously there were people who were censored and denied their funds. And so those people, you know, resonate with that experience, but almost in China, you can almost imagine that the entire country has been subjected to that experience. And so it's like an interesting grounds to see how adoption and education could still be very resilient. Um, I believe if Europe and the United States uh, take the path of um, being more like China in some ways, and in some ways, you know, and this is a separate discussion, but in some ways I feel like the the American surveillance state and other surveillance states also are very advanced. They don't they don't like outright ban you and things like that, or they don't outright jail you for now for certain actions. But uh it's almost more pervasive because there's more data kind of collected. Um and I think it depends on like we we grow up with like a setting that we assume we live in a utopia. And the one thing about China that I always try to tell people is like, China is just like a country. It's got a government that's like very techno nationalist. It's very hard on people. Um, that's my opinion, obviously. Um, but it, it's not like just because there is a dystopian elements to China that you can't see the same thing here in Canada in the United States and in Europe. And it's more a matter of like, China is like a government or a nation state that takes some things to an extreme. But you got to be careful with A, this can happen here. And B, um, just because, you know, China is this like mysterious, exotic place or whatever, it doesn't mean that those principles don't also come here. Power corrupts absolutely, whether that's in China or in the West. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have 
have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty 100 percent and i saw it already i mean it's not that bad uh, but i saw it uh, firsthand in my account um i worked one year uh outside of austria which was in germany and there i had a new company uh, the company we had a new bank account uh, and i had the same bank account basically that i had in austria because it's, it, you don't need a German bank account. You can use your Austrian bank account uh, because of the EU. Uh, and I, from this bank account, it's like there's money coming in, there's some expenses, and almost everything else goes to some Bitcoin exchange. That That's how my bank account looks. Uh, and uh, I didn't knew it, but my account got red flagged because of that. And uh, the first salary that uh, German uh, a company wanted to send me they came back to me and said like, oh, like uh, we cannot transfer you um, uh, something because the, the bank called us and said like, oh, there seems to be a fraudulent transaction. And, and the company CEO said like, no, I did that transaction. And mm -hmm. she's like, are you sure? <laughs> like, it's a, it, it's to a red flagged uh, account. And then he came to me and like, Hey, uh, is, are you sure that, that Iban and, and everything is, is correct? Your ID. Uh, and I was like, yeah, that's correct. And he's like, yeah, your bank account is red flagged. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, so, yeah. so this is also happening here. It's, it's just like, it, there's no consequence because, uh, the transaction then got through, uh, and then the bank said like, okay, now it's, it's like we deleted that red flag of that account also because now we know, okay, it's actually the person that works and stuff like that. Uh, but there are no small things in place. Um, and sometimes I think we are not that far away from that. Um, there, there may, may be a different, there, uh, there, there might be a big difference in there, but it's not that we are uh, co complete freedom and there's like nothing going on like that. There's a lot like that going on. I also tried to get a credit and I had to get to like, I don't know, 30. Uh, I just wanted to, to try it out. Uh, I, I had to go through 30, uh, com uh, banks to, for one to like say like, okay, let's, let's do it. And for everyone, the same reason was like, oh, we see those bitcoin transactions we don't like that currently uh, I, I don't know if it's still like that it, it's it's some years uh, ago but uh it's it's really interesting how bitcoin is also seen here as something something not good like something fraudulent it, it changed a lot actually in, in the last few years i have the feeling but uh it's it's not uh i, I just wanted to bring that <laughs> uh, perspective of an austrian also here because it's still yeah. uh still like that uh, i think there's a lot going on but you brought up your book and it's actually something that i wanted to bring in all, all earlier but uh yeah um what is the, the the book about? The book is called Mao. Uh, would Mao hold uh, Bitcoin? First of all, for those who don't know who's Mao and and uh, what the what is then the book about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the title is a little bit clickbait, but um, <laughs> okay. Um, but um, so Mao Zedong, uh, Chinese uh, revolutionary leader, basically built um, the communist China that we know today. Uh, his portrait hangs above. Uh, you know, in Beijing, in the highest halls of power, he's kind of like the seen as um, almost like the father of modern China, I guess you could say. Um, China in the 20th century went through so many different changes. Like it went from uh, dynasties that spanned like thousands of years to a short lived republic uh, and then to a nationalist kind of, um, you could say, like martial law state. And then into a uh, communist um, dictatorship, essentially. Uh, but then even within that, um, after Mao's death, um, there is a new China kind of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, it's called, 
Um, and that is the China of today of, well, you think like, well, isn't China a communist country, but they're really into buying Bitcoin and they buy shares and they buy housing. So how does that work? Right. Or like, you know, and, um, so the book kind of starts there actually it might be surprising. Some people would say like, well, if you're doing a book on Bitcoin in China, shouldn't you start in like 20, 2009 or 2008? But uh, my book actually starts, well, it really, really starts like thousands of years because like it just goes through like some of the Chinese monetary history, not like a huge amount. Initially, when I first wrote the book, it was three chapters of Chinese history. So you all Bitcoiners who, who read or write or, or who, who get that book uh, got lucky because my editors have subsequently told me to remove like a lot of a lot of pages because I was I was almost getting to a point where it's like, well, where does this get to the Bitcoin? Right uh, now it's like a tight, I think, 20 pages. Um, but uh, it really describes kind of like the span of like why Chinese people were so fascinated with Bitcoin in the first place, because in order to understand that, you have to understand a little bit of in China. That's kind of where the first forms of credit money and paper money were invented. Um, and that has led to in the past lots of significant political changes. Uh, two of them, uh, for example, one is the Yuan Dynasty. If you all remember uh, Genghis Khan, uh, fun fact about him, I think like zero point something percent of all Asian males traces uh, heritage to to Genghis Khan. So it's a busy, busy, busy Mongol emperor and created basically an empire that spanned across the world. And then the Yuan uh, dynasty, uh, people might know in this context, especially Europeans, when Marco Polo visited China, that was during this uh, dynasty. It was uh, Kublai Khan, it was the Mongols kind of like ruling China. Um, that was one of the most powerful empires on earth and it fell apart because they could not control the money supply at the end of the reign. I mean, there were other reasons too, but a large reason was because they couldn't control the money supply. And actually, uh, we're talking about Mao Zedong and Mao actually came to power partially because the nationalist government at the time, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, was seen as mismanaging the country's finances. And so there was a lot of inflation. There's a slide I usually present uh, whenever I'm going on a tour and it shows this girl holding the equivalent of 10 US dollars in Chinese currency at the time right before Mao went to power. And uh, it was 444,000 of those units. So like, you know, obviously in the West, people think about the Weimar Republic and they think about the wheelbarrows of money. And China had a really similar experience with that. And it helped, uh, you know, Mao Zedong get power ultimately. Um, so that's, we start there and then it goes through, the book really goes through like, you know, some perspectives from different OGs and, different sources I interviewed, like what happened? How is it that China was able to create so many, if you think about like Bitmain, if you think about like Binance, you know, if you think about uh, all the mining pools that came out, Ample, F2 Pool, all those others, like how did that all come about, right? And um, it's an interesting thought um, to think about, um, just even like, you know, again, we're talking about adoption. I make the argument that China, that, Bitcoin really matured in China into like at least a little bit of a teenager. Cause you're talking about like before that era of ASICs, right. Of uh mining ships specific to Bitcoin, you know, you're talking about like people just like CPU mining, you're talking about people, GPU mining, like it's kind of cool. People are selling like baklavas for like, you know, 50, you know, 50 Bitcoins for pizza, all this other stuff, you know, all this really cool stuff. But you know, in China, a generation of entrepreneurs, they built like the first like custom mining chips. They really built out like some of the mining pools, some of the largest exchanges in the world, especially after Mt. Gox failed, uh, came about there. So it kind of dives into like the history of it, which is really the history of Bitcoin, especially during that phase. Um, and then also goes into like some of the motivations behind why people saw that way, right? Uh, you know, money without the state being such a powerful idea, kind of going back to the first chapter. And then I would say the rest of the book really goes into, um, you know, like, why is the government ban Bitcoin? Why does the government think Bitcoin is such a threat? Um, what is going on with the digital yen, which is kind of like the central bank digital currency that's a response to Bitcoin? Um, and what does that mean? And towards the end of the chapter, and I've been writing a lot about this recently for Forbes and Bitcoin Magazine, um, but, um, well, more for Forbes, but 
um, you know, the idea is like, what does that mean for like the global uh, nation state kind of driven game or theory around Bitcoin, right? Because you have China as like a very strong, like no to Bitcoin camp. And not only has it said no to Bitcoin, it's proposed its own alternative solution, which is the digital yuan. And this idea that, um, you know, countries should fight Bitcoin with uh, their own digital currencies, right? So it kind of talks about that a little bit. Um, interestingly, though, I do think China, well, first, it's like, my hope is that you would understand three things after reading the book. There's only three things that you understand. One is hopefully a little bit about China, um, because as you mentioned, Robin, like a lot of Bitcoiners may or may not know. And I'm, I'm always trying to tell people like, you know, the more you study about other people's histories, it's just a richer corpus and view. And uh, Chinese monetary history, super, super fascinating because it's been through so many cycles. And so you can kind of differently see the more iterations, right? So you know how like as Bitcoiners, we're so focused on inflation, we're so focused on the political consequences of inflation, right? Um, and really with China, you can see that play out over like longer cycles, right? With, the, with like Western economic history, you know, maybe it starts like the nation state, maybe starts in 1848, you know, kind of thing. And then, you know, the Fed starts in like 1913 and like, there's all these things, like there's obviously been some cycles, but you can, um, you know, like I was just reading something about how quantity theory of money was developed independently in China uh, before Friedman described it by some gap of like uh, a few, like at least a thousand and some years. The reason why is because there was an idea of paper money and fiat money much earlier in China than anywhere else. So understanding China, um, and you know, understanding any history is fascinating, but I think understanding Chinese history can be really fascinating in terms of politics and the finances. The second thing I really want people to understand is why is there a bottoms up demand from Chinese people, not the government, but the Chinese people for Bitcoin? Like, why do they want to get involved in Bitcoin? Why are they entrepreneurs building the next kind of great Bitcoin businesses? Why are they kind of doing that? And, and the honest answer is, I think, money and profit. But uh, in order to understand that, you have to understand the first a little bit because you have to understand why China is incentivizing profit. Um, and then the third uh, is kind of like the top down, like what, why China as a nation state is so against Bitcoin, right? And a while ago, I think you asked me this question and I actually kind of missed it. But you had asked, um, like, you know, with China's Bitcoin adoption, I think like, you know, what is it? about it or something like that, that like the what, like if the government is able to ban it, um, you know, why is that been such an issue for adoption? Right. Um, and I think what you see is that the government is able to turn the opinions of some people and is able to make it more difficult would attack Bitcoin. That's the one thing about the Chinese party state, like they do understand new technologies. When I talked to Will from Damas, like they had Damas taken down from the app store within like two or three days or something like that. Um, but they also actually started attacking the default relays. Um, they understood that those were like using web sockets uh, that had certain IP addresses and they put those behind the great firewall. This is actually traditionally what they do uh, for technologies like Matrix and other things. They also, the Chinese party state has also banned Tor and has employed very clever techniques in order to prevent people in China from using Tor. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about this like very sophisticated state that's able to do so much and different things and has definitely pulled some pretty significant punches in its ability. I think any country that is looking to ban Bitcoin uh, or harm Bitcoin is likely going to have something similar to China's path, right? They're going to look at the fact that like most people use exchanges to, to onboard, um, you know, you can attack one or two key points and then you, you're able to kind of like co-opt the system or in the case of the United States or Canada, you know, you can, you can uh, have most of the funds go to ETFs and then you can have, um, you know, become custody coin or surveillance coin, and then everybody else can use stable coins and et cetera. So that's its own different thing. But um, it's kind of like a playbook for countries. And so uh, what I always say, the third thing I want people to leave with 
is like the top down view and why that matters. Like first, because China is trying to propose an alternative model that non Bitcoin following countries uh, can kind of lay out like they can create their own central bank digital currency. They can put restrictions on cryptocurrency and stuff like that. I believe there will be some countries that will follow that example. But um, I think that uh, all three combined together allow you to really understand the history, the bottoms up and top down, why Bitcoin is such an enduring force and why Bitcoin um, is able to grow at the rate it's growing. I've never felt more bullish. And ironically, that's been like, even though I've talked to like people who are like the most or some of the most repressed when it comes to Bitcoin. And that's what gives me hope. Like I meet people who are in China or who have been to China several times and or who uh, grew up in China and they're doing their university uh, abroad and stuff like that. And to see even those like four or five kind of kernels of hope of like, yeah, I'm really into Bitcoin. I don't want to use WeChat Pay anymore. It's like privacy invading, things like that. That that has made me uh, bullish beyond like price level and sentiment. Just like it is the right thing to be doing, if that makes sense. Even if things don't turn out completely right, as Havel says or has said. <laughs> I love that a lot. It's 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 so great to, to to hear that story, and it's also uh, so great to finally have this on the podcast where we have this uh, reality of lo what actually happens in in China and why it is like that. Yeah. Which brings me to to my kind of last topic. I really want to get into with you today is. is the broader nation state uh, game theory adoption standpoint um, where it's interesting. We have China really, um, let's say, cracking down on it. Uh, and then we have the US where potentially on Tuesday, um, uh, the next president is someone who has a lot of Bitcoiners supposed bitcoiners on their sure. <laughs> on, on 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 his tickets uh and he's speaking quite good about it and he made a big change like five years ago donald trump yeah. he spoke really badly about bitcoin and crypto in general uh and now he speaks good about it i don't know how much he understands it probably like two percent of it uh but he understands it so he understands that there's a huge community that he needs to win an election. And that in itself is really powerful. So where do you see this? Uh, and then we have the ECP, the not, don't, not, don't, let's not forget the Europeans uh, yeah, that yeah. say that Bitcoin is going to 10 million. So that's why we should tax it and we should ban it. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, that's, that. that's what I got out of that paper. I don't know what you got out of that paper. Uh, but yeah, like how do you see the current uh, nation state adoption and, and uh, the status of that? Yeah, actually, um, so you, you had asked a really concise question that I missed that I'll tie into this point. Um, which is, uh, where, um, how do I see Bitcoin changing China? Oh yeah. Or, I forgot or, about or, that. Yeah. yeah true. Yeah, yeah. That's like, they took me, don't worry. I, I also forgot about it. It took me a few cycles. I was like, I, I thought you had asked a really good question and I was going to get to, and then, but I'll tie that into this. because I think it, it, it does play a, a role, um, into this. Um, so people ask me and they're always like, well, um, so I'll give you an example of like when I did like real um journalism on the ground in hong kong so initially when the hong kong protests were going on i was kind of and you never should really do this um but i was like hmm, wouldn't it be like a really clean and simple story to be like oh a lot of people are protesting in hong kong against the system so that might lead to an openness in bitcoin right and there were some signs of that like for example people refused to use digital kind of travel cards because there's an awareness that the police were surveilling that. And one of the parts of the protests were that they were protesting the system economically. There were almost like separate economies in Hong Kong. It was really interesting. They had this thing called pro yellow and kind of like pro blue and pro blue meant you supported the police and pro yellow meant you supported the protesters and the pro yellow block kind of had their own businesses and they had their own transaction economy. And if you were like, you know, supporting the police, you wouldn't go to these restaurants that had like a pro yellow sign on it. And if you were supporting the protesters, you wouldn't go to, you know, the police restaurants and things like that. Right. There are also people who are trying to get away from the Hong Kong dollar by saying that, like, you know, a vote against the Hong Kong dollar is a vote against the system. We no longer have faith and confidence. Um, the Hong Kong protests mostly started because 
uh, Hong Kongers felt like they weren't getting universal suffrage. They weren't getting the ability to be able to vote for their leaders fully. The, the reasons why are very complex and like not necessarily super suited for this podcast, but I encourage people to do their own research if they want on this one country, two systems, basic law, universal suffrage, 2019, 2014, Hong Kong protests and the Hong Kong 47. Those are all keywords I would use if you were looking into that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, the thing that's been really interesting with that is when I went I was like, you know, like, hey, is there like more Bitcoin demand? Because you you see all these people like peeling away from the government, right? So like, and uh, that was like kind of like the first thing I kind of understood is like, it's not that clean and simple. So first I, I, I emailed like the ATM providers. I was like, has there been more demand for Bitcoin from the ATMs? And they're like, no, you idiot. Everybody's protesting. There's like nobody who's like coming to our atms because they're all busy like they're shoving the streets full of like you know like they're all protesting so i'm like oh okay interesting then i talked to some of the exchanges and i'm like well do you see like a bitcoin premium and like yeah like i i did end up writing an article about that like some people saw like a little bit of a bump there was like a little bit of a premium for the hong kong dollar versus like other places so might that be like a sign that like you know, some Hong Kongers were interested in hedging away in Bitcoin, um, but it was very small and there was a lot of like back and forth on that. And then I was like, well, maybe some Hong Kong groups use Bitcoin. Um, and the thing about that is like they don't tend to. Now, there was this uh, outlet called Hong Kong Free Press and they used to take Bitcoin through a BTC pay server, but they've now since switched to using Brave uh, or BAT to raise funds. Um, I'm not actually too sure why they made that switch. But um, in general, what I've heard is uh, for Hong Kong groups that are already risking themselves, they don't, they see Bitcoin as like an additional complication. Like if you're already doing things, things that are, might be illegal according to Hong Kong laws, uh, why add potential money laundering charges as well? This is despite the fact that in Hong Kong, HSBC proactively froze accounts of people belonging to protesters. Right. So you think this is like a perfect maelstrom of Bitcoin adoption factors. Like if I heard about all these things, I would go run and try to find Bitcoin as soon as possible as well. Right. Um, but it just wasn't as uh, clean as that. And and to me, that experience informed my answer of like, you know, how will Bitcoin change China? Because people probably think mm, or I've had some people say, uh, I'm not saying me, but, you know, there's always people who are like the Chinese Communist Party will fall, will fail uh, because of this and that. Um, Bitcoin will play some kind of role in that. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not one of those people that predicts the CCP will fail like any given time. Um, I think it's like the same thing as trying to predict with certainty. Uh, and I know a lot of people in Bitcoin, including people on your show, have like very accurate technical analysis of where Bitcoin's price will be. That's not, I, I respect those people. That's not me. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't think I can really understand when the CCP will fail. The example I always bring to people is like, think about Iran. Iran's government is so much more weaker from like an economic standpoint. They have to import all these different things. Like, um, you know, Israel just hit their missile manufacturing things. They import from China, right? They're sanctioned by so many different places, like their persona non grata, they have like enemies all over the place, like the Western Bloc, Israel, everywhere. Um, but still Iran since 1979 has been ruled by the mullahs, right? Has been ruled by uh, the um, Khomeini and, you know, anyways, whatever. That's like going off a little bit of a tangent. But my point is that, um, that that's a much weaker government for which you could make the argument that Iran, you know, if you look at it from like an economic perspective, if you look at it from just how interconnected they are, if you look at it from like, even just like how much threat they are probably under, right. Probably would have folded, you know, think about the inflation in the real as well. Right. Think about like the average uh, income of the Iranian people and things like that. But it still hasn't. It's found a way to persist and survive still to this day. So I say, like, 
you know, to people and, and modern day China, Deng Xiaoping's China has about the same uh, birth span is as that year. I might have gotten it. Don't quote me, but I think the Iranian revolution is 1979. But um, Deng Xiaoping um, and his reform and opening up period actually really started during 1978. Um, but the Chinese Communist Party is much stronger than Iran. Right. Just as an example, like economically speaking, they have a ton of foreign reserves. They're not as sanctioned. Um, there's a lot larger population and the population has over the last 30 or 40 years seen like uh, relative economic growth, although not like to the degree of like matching a Taiwan or anything like that yet. Right. So just very difficult to tell if <clears throat> or when the CCP will change whether that's like internal politics or whether it's external. I think currently the assumption has to be that they're going to be around at least for a while, I think. Um, and with Xi Jinping in power and an unprecedented, he he's the current paramount leader of China um, and he is holding power for another term. So it's going to be him for another five years at least, right? Until 2029. Um, and so there's not necessarily going to be like that much change in that regard. But what I always tell people is that Bitcoin, it's not a simple narrative. It's not like, I don't like the Chinese party state and what it does. And so therefore I will use Bitcoin as a protest vote, or I will go on Nostra and post about Tiananmen Square. Now, there are some people like that. And it is cool to see that uh, there is a risk that people are taking. But if you go on Nostra, for example, you do see one or two people, they post about whistleblowers, they post about Tiananmen Square. I don't discount these things. It's very cool to see it. And if you are in the mainland and you are making these statements, you are taking a risk. And that has to be acknowledged. Um, but it's not like there's this like mass movement, if that makes sense. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, even like there's not really Bitcoin meetups or anything like that in a public sense. There's not really like conferences or events for people that for people to get together. So there isn't this sense of like, you know, for example, in the West or in Europe or things like that, you can organize kind of openly. Right. And you can say like, hey, like we believe in these kind of things. You might even have pro Bitcoin candidates uh, like you had in the French elections right before. But uh, in China, you don't have these things. But but Bitcoin hits right at the crux of the Chinese Communist Party's biggest weakness, which is it allows people since the CCP, since 1978, has pursued a path of it's glorious to get rich. Doesn't matter if it's a black or a white cat, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. That's Deng Xiaoping's quotes, right? He was the leader uh, in that period of time who changed China from being a communist country to a communist country with stock markets, right? Since then, there's been this radical change. So Chinese people no longer, it's, it's heaven has to be delivered on earth, if that makes sense. If I don't see it, if I can't eat it right now, then that's not worth talking about. Because when Mao ruled, it was always like, we are preparing our society for heaven. So there's a little bit of, you know, there's also propaganda about how bad things were, how good things were, but you know, millions of people starved and things like that, right? With modern day China, you know, you don't necessarily have that. And now people can make money. They can make money and they can be comfortable and they can buy housing and they can really upgrade themselves, um, you know, not only just in China, but like across the world. What I've, what I've heard talking to Chinese people is that they're quite prideful of like, even the smaller things, like, for example, if they travel with a Chinese passport, they now feel more respected because China as a country is more economically wealthy. But the thing is that the, the party state, the Chinese Communist Party says, you only had that wealth because of us. And you're only going to keep that wealth if you save it within the Chinese system. So there's the capital controls, right? So you're only allowed to exit $50,000 USD a year per person. That's been relaxed a little bit for some expats and depending on what area of uh, China you live in. So it's not like absolutely firm anymore. And there have always been exceptions to that. But in general, the idea is that the Chinese Communist Party has always played this balance of like, we need the Chinese people to be entrepreneurial. 
like Bitcoin miners, like Bitcoin exchanges and stuff like that. But we need to control where their efforts go and we need to control where that money and savings go. So if you think about China's story, it really is a story of savings. China's savings rate is structurally one of the highest in the world. And as a result, their bank reserves, so their M2 to GDP ratio, which is kind of a way of measuring uh, broader bank money compared to GDP, is one of the highest, if not the highest, I believe Hong Kong and China are the highest M2 GDPs in the world. Um, and that's just a combination of people can only really save in the domestic system and they can only really buy domestic assets. But what if you go and you say there is this asset that lies outside the system that has none of these restrictions. So you can choose to spend and save your money wherever you want. And now you live in a country where that is almost like the central faith. You know, in China now they call it like the spiritual void because there's all kinds of things that are trying to fill that. There's people who are saying we should hearken back to the Confucian days. There's this and that. There's a lot of worry about that actually because I think there's some discourse about how in Chinese society it's become all about the money, ironically. Right. Like that's the one thing I think that I've come to appreciate being in China, talking with Chinese people. People really want to make bucks in a way that I don't think like, you know how sometimes it's like the European mind cannot comprehend or the American mind, like the Western mind cannot comprehend how hustly Chinese entrepreneurs are like just cannot comprehend it. it it's a combination of like, you know, like being a generation. I think this is my hypothesis. It's like a generation of being away from, you know, absolute poverty and like also just like a cultural, like people are like, because wealth is so important, people are like out for each other. Right. Um, so this is the central value of China today. The central value of China today is how wealthy you are. People look down upon other people because they don't wear Louis Vuitton or things like that. This happens outside of China too. I'm not saying like for everyone, obviously there are exceptions, there are people with, you know, different beliefs and stuff like that. But in general, that gist is there. Well, then Bitcoin is a superior form of saving your wealth and it gets rid of all these restrictions. And, um, you know, it's really appealing. And by using Bitcoin, you're exiting the system. That's the thing the Chinese Communist Party fears the most because it needs to control that system of capital flight. Um, because if too much capital leaves at once, then China's whole system kind of starts buckling under a little bit. Like it doesn't really work unless you are able to give uh, cheap loans to Chinese state owned companies. You can only get that if Chinese people are forced to save within China. Right. So that's kind of on that front. Now, um, nation state adoption. I know. Sorry. This is like a really long tangent. But nation state adoption, I think just based off of that, um, what I've told people is like, I based off of what I just said, I think it'd be very surprising. Um, like if you had two takeaways from what I just said, one, China's probably not going to change political leadership in that sense. Two, if Bitcoin does have role to play, it's already doing that, but not in a like revolution, like let's make a revolution by Bitcoin, but more just like Bitcoin is the revolution, if that makes sense. Um, like it's something the government doesn't want you to do, but people will do anyways, cause it'll make them assets return. So China, the country, you're not going to hear, you're going to hear positive headlines, but you're not going to hear, um, substantive changes that might not matter for Bitcoin's price. For example, um, a couple of Chinese policy people, including a former vice minister of finance said something along the lines of, well, we might've made a mistake. And Trump is talking about cryptocurrencies now in Bitcoin. We should probably study it, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, if China changes its stance on like the digital yuan and Bitcoin, I think that's very unlikely. But um, you're likely going to see a lot of like really positive headlines because Trump is talking about Bitcoin. Now, no matter what my opinions about Trump are, and I have a lot, <laughs> um, you know, I, I every time I post about him, I make it a point to also post that he fundraised through world financial liberty. Just like I always, I don't, I don't ever have an article that goes by without me mentioning that. Like I never say what, anyways, he has his policies that he's proposed, you know, politicians, they say a big game. We'll see whether or not they actually act accordingly. Same thing with Trump. 
Um, but the fact that he is talking about Bitcoin and I get for him, he does say crypto quite a lot, you know, but the fact that he's talking about Bitcoin, I think is important to that kind of, you know, like it's not going to change China's path, but for countries that are kind of like set on that Chinese path, it might make them doubt kind of where it's going. The one thing it unquestionably probably does is that it changes the Western bloc to be more stable coin oriented. Um, I wonder how this is going to play out with Europe, because I know the ECB is a pretty big fan of the digital euro. And as you talked about, they just released a paper. Um, although one thing I will say is because I've suffered from this a little bit, you know, like I'm like a pay on of Forbes. No, I'm kidding. But like, you know, like I'm a content writer of Forbes and people are like Forbes has said and you got to be careful sometimes. Like, for example, The Economist, I, I did notice his kind of um, I forget his name, but his profile says like his views are strictly his. And not those of the ECBs necessarily. Like, like we don't. Yeah, I just I think Jürgen Schaaf. I think is his name. Jürgen Schaaf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't disagree that it's probably how the ECB is thinking about it, or it's or it's symptomatic or close to. But you know, sometimes because um, at the end of the day, it's like kind of like the the governing board that matters, like Kristen Lagarde or something like that. Like it's not necessarily their analysts that might be symptomatic, but it's not necessarily. You know, so it remains to be seen kind of how Europe deals with this. But I think uh, with Trump, uh, there's a lot of big movement towards stable coins. A lot, a lot of big movement towards stable coins. I, I, I actually think that's going to be Bitcoin's biggest challenge, at least in the Western bloc, is like how to separate itself from stable coins or where it makes sense and where it doesn't. And you're seeing this play out in like really interesting ways, I think. Like, so for example, from a regulatory standpoint, like Canada just recently said, it's not going to release a central bank digital currency. It's probably going to use stable coins similar to the States. You know, the States um, is trying to pass a stable coin act um, to regulate. And they've already like the judicial authorities already work with Tether to a certain degree. I think that in the nation state adoption kind of game, um, I mean, remains to see if Trump actually, you know, gets Bitcoin um, going through um, and actually commits and does the Bitcoin reserve. I think that will make a difference. Um, but I also think that from a policy standpoint, the central, because the central banks operate separately from the presidency. In a sense, it, it almost doesn't really matter how the president thinks. It's like the academic, unless Trump appoints someone totally out of left field for Jay Powell, um, a central banker is still a central banker. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're not, they're not necessarily going to be like that much different in that view. So I, I do think, you know, there's things that leaders can do as kind of like from the federal side, but then there's like just the entrenched interests of like central bankers and just the way they think. And I don't think that will necessarily change. I think the people in the Western bloc will probably look at stable coins. And lastly, I wrote about this, like, I think you're going to start seeing bottoms up adoption and you're going to see countries, you know, we're all trying to figure out Maya. I interviewed her for Forbes really briefly. Like if she's going to be the next, you know, what's the next country that's going to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. There's like a couple of candidates, you know, there's been a Mexican senator that's been proposing that law. Um, there may be Argentina, although it seems like Malay is more focused on uh, or he hasn't committed to his promise to freely use the U.S. dollar yet. So that's also difficult to see 100 percent. Or maybe it's something like surname, if depending on, you know, all the variables. I don't I don't actually even ever after having interviewed her. I think she's great. I think she's a great person. But I, I don't honestly know enough about Suriname's political process to understand if she has a realistic chance of being the next president, right? I've been told some things. I think it would be really good for Bitcoin for her to be in that seat. Um, but I, that's what I, I think you're going to start to see. You're going to see like the, the countries of the world kind of split off a little bit. And some of them are going to use like the CBDCs. Uh, and some of them are going to use like Interestingly, I think Russia is actually using Bitcoin or they're trying to use Bitcoin mining because I think there's like an energy surplus state. So they're playing Bitcoin in a sense of uh, accumulating an energy surplus and turning it into a more acceptable currency. Because normally what they would do is they would mine, they would take their oil or whatever. They would take their surplus energy, they would sell it for the US dollar. 
but they're trying to uh, change that, right? So it's been interesting to see them kind of do Bitcoin mining. Um, but I think by and large, there's going to be a block of countries that are going to be more on the China path, the central bank digital currencies interacting with each other. And prominent among those is like Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, which have already signed up to a pilot program, along with the Bank of Thailand and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to work with China on an inter central bank digital currency bridge. Um, I think you're going to see in the West, like states will support uh, stable coins because they're buying up so much of the debt. And then I think stable coins are going to be an interesting thing that will not be like competitive with Bitcoin, but it's kind of like the next anchor, right? And then you're going to see some countries uh, aggressively embrace uh, Bitcoin, I think, with the strategic reserve or they'll mine it themselves. Uh, but I think those countries are slowly getting on board right now. And what I think that playbook looks like is like any energy surplus country will start to have a incentive to mine Bitcoin. So you see Bhutan, Ethiopia and other places. And I think that's going to continue. It may be overt or not overt. Like Bhutan didn't announce the fact that they mined so much Bitcoin until like very recently, right? Um, and then you might see also this idea of like Bitcoin strategic reserve and then like the Bitcoin legal tender, but that will probably be much slower. Um, my hope is that there's a few countries that come online at the same time. So meaning um, like what you really need for it to work, like where Bitcoin doesn't play right now, is between different countries that are systematically important in global supply chains. So what you see now is you see the US buying oil and now you're starting to see the Chinese buy oil with digital yuan that started to happen as early as last year in 2023. Um, when you start seeing nation states kind of use Bitcoin to get on that stand to, to trade with each other, I think that's gonna be another, another meaningful pivot um, but it's it's going to be like a weird space because there's so much. I think the younger generation of like Bitcoin only politicians, it's like a bet on whether or not those people get to power first versus the top down. But the top down, like the older people that are kind of like Donald Trump using Bitcoin to get contributions and things like that. I don't think they really RFK was like, I think the only exception I've seen. It's like an older generation guy who like really, really got into the nuances of like Bitcoin and specifically Bitcoin only. And he, but I don't he, know if that will happen for the rest. And even he attended uh, other conferences, like he was on 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 crypto yeah. conferences, blockchain conferences. But he, I think he really um, either has someone behind him who really briefs him perfectly, <laughs> or he actually went ahead and did a did a really good deep deep dive, like his speech. Um, uh, was written so good at the Bitcoin National Conference. Like he yeah. really hit all the points that Bitcoiners want to hear. Imagine Donald Trump would have given RFK speech. That would have been a massive, massive thing. Uh, his, yeah. his, like that, that, that was like, that, that would have been the <laughs> home run and would probably have made some, uh, some big waves. But yeah, as a president, um, maybe also, cannot speak as maybe uh, someone just like in a member of uh, administration. I, I also have empathy for that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to see. Um, <laughs> as yeah. a European, I, I don't care too much about American politics, but it feels like it has an impact on Bitcoin. I don't know if it actually has one, uh, long term, but yeah, I, I definitely watch, uh, right now American politics more than Austrian politics and European politics. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's fascinating also for me. Uh, but yeah, uh, really cool. I, I love the topic. Like, honestly, like it's, it's, it's such a fascinating thing. And I'm just like sitting here and, and learning from you. It's, it's, uh, I, I, it's a great honor also for me to, to learn so much, uh, from this process we are already at one hour 20 minutes i usually try to keep it at one hour but sometimes it's just too interesting for that <laughs> so Sorry thank you for yeah, that I thought, I thought i thought yeah my, my bad my bad for that <laughs> oh no no like uh, i honestly like it like uh uh if if it's if it's longer than one hour, it usually is a sign that it was so interesting that I like really want to hear more about it. Uh, so uh, I, I like it a lot. Really cool. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast. Before uh, I have a question that every one of my guests gets, um, yeah. what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and maybe uh, besides all the things that we already talked about today? Um, 
Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I knew you asked this, but then I didn't really prep an answer for it. Um, so uh, what I would say is uh, what I what I try to tell other people is like to um, obviously we talk a lot about China. So I'm not going to say like learn China. But what I will say is um, I learned quite a few different languages. I grew up with French. I grew up with Spanish. And I know there's a lot of people who say um, eventually you uh, are not going to need any of this because AI will come and teach you all these languages or will come and translate for you perfectly. But what I found is like when you read in the original source like language and you are able to have conversations with people kind of in their native language, you get uh, access to a lot more um, insights and feelings rather than kind of like programmatic. I feel like that's, that's like, if there's one thing I would, you know, hopefully people can learn from me is just like being, curious and and being open to just like spanning across multiple cultures is um key to finding things that you might not otherwise find absolutely really really cool um i i i always like i my second language is english <laughs> i'm still struggling yeah. with that uh but yeah it's like uh i i have german and english but i'm really bad with la languages actually it took me a long while to even get English down and English is a relatively e easy language compared to some other languages. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, well, I, I'm not a language guy, but I really wanted to uh, dive deep in other languages, especially also because my girlfriend is speaking Hindi. Uh, this is oh. something that I, I, I probably should get <laughs> going a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, languages are really, uh, I think it's it's more about now learning the culture with with the language uh, than actually having a language skill. As you said, the language skill itself uh, is getting less and less important with with technology. But it's so much uh, it, you learn a lot about the culture. Also. I, I loved it a lot. Yeah, perfect. We have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest where, without knowing who the next guest actually is, and uh, this could be a whole nother podcast this question, uh, but let's see what, what you say, say about it how do you envision the future solutions of layer two technologies so basically how do we uh, scale bitcoin oh. <laughs> like, totally. um yeah and then i have to also come up with something like this but okay i probably should have watched the last one um yeah i have a lot of thoughts about this actually which uh, could in of itself be its own podcast but to be like kind of short and concise um yeah, I mean, um, I think that uh, there. I was just recently at Bitcoin Plus uh, Plus talking about eCash and all those different things in Arc. Um, I think that right now Lightning um, needs to be. I, I think that the use case right now seems to be like very. We seem to be in this world of like the next billion. Seems to be like really into stable coins and really into like trading between different tokens and stuff like that. So when you look at like, for example, Lightning, right, their latest release Taproot assets is kind of a reflection of this, I think. Um, I would like to see a world where people get paid more in Bitcoin. I think that would solve a lot of different problems. And then, um, you know, you have, I'm not an awesome, I, I think like the L2s, like they have the advantage of not being as easily ossified. Right. Um, because the L2s can be like a lot more experimental. They move a lot quicker. For example, Liquid, I mean, that's just to give a hypothetical example. They just release simplicity. Right. That's like its own thing. I have my own opinion about that. It's a more Turing complete programming language. But the fact is that L2s can move faster um, than base layer can. Um, I think that um, Lightning, specifically the two areas that I think are the most important to solve for for scalability, one is uh, how do you get the non-custodial, uh, how do you get the custodial, um, the, the self-custody experience up to the level that you need it to be for Lightning to be like fully or not, maybe even not fully. I mean, there's always going to be a role for Lightning service providers, but um, to more self-custody, right? So like, how do you create that experience? Um, I think that there's a lot of focus with Arc, for example, on like how you can collapse that into UTXOs. Um and how you can reduce the fee rate for doing that. Um, but I also think another thing that's really important is just even like, how do you get people to that level where they're running their own node, right? Um, so that's kind of like 
how I think about L2s, but I have my own different thoughts. I'm like an L2 expert, but I just kind of like riffing off that question. Um, it's a good thing I know something about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's super interesting also for me because uh, like I actually get paid in, in Bitcoin, uh, not all of it because I, I, I get paid from different sources, uh, yeah. but all my Bitcoin sponsors uh, uh, pay me in Bitcoin. So, so it's yeah. been a whole new experience setting this up, uh, how to receive payments, how do we do that? Uh, it, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's really, uh, you get to know the technology in a different way. So that really helps also like, um, to, to develop those things because then you use those technologies. This gives them the technologies a bit more funds to work with. This yeah. uh, funds more development. So it's, it's slowly, but honestly, I'm surprised how, how well we already have those medium of exchange yeah. technologies because Bitcoin right now is in the store of value adoption phase and we're already seeing a lot of adoption in the medium of exchange. So it's, it's quite, I, I feel like uh, when I came into 2020 with Bitcoin, um, I made myself like some expectation. Okay. Where's Bitcoin in five years? Where's Bitcoin in 10 years? And honestly, it, it completely blew up my expectation. Like it, it went way better than, than I thought. I didn't have El Salvador on the radar. I didn't have definitely not uh, a U.S. Yeah. presidential, uh, candidate talking about it. And like even talking about it, I hadn't on, on, on my radar. So the, the, the developments, I feel like it's, it's really good. But yeah, um, let's, let's conclude. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for being on, uh, Roger. Um, before I let you go, before, uh, that, uh, where can people find you? Ask your questions, read more about you, read your, your, your contributions. Yeah. Let me, uh, get it out of focus and into focus. This is the book, Would Mao Hold Bitcoin? And so, uh, they can, people can find this on Amazon or Bitcoin magazine. Um, if they want to pay in Bitcoin, Bitcoin magazine. Um, and then there's always Amazon available. Amazon does have like an ebook version. So I think that's like easier for some people. Um, I'm also doing events. Um, so I'm going to be speaking at adopting Bitcoin. I'm going to be at SatsConf, uh, and I'm going to be at the African Bitcoin conference. Um, probably going to be like next year when all the, cause the circuit kind of dies for the next three months, I think, or there might be some events, but between December to April, it doesn't feel like there's a ton of events. But, uh, you know, probably we'll do everything back up when it gets back up and people can find me on X at Roger H 1991, unfortunately, <laughs> my birth year, because I'm so OPSEC 10,000 um, and uh, Noster as well, uh, low key uh, at Noster dash verify dot com. Um, yeah, that's my NIP 05. Um, but otherwise, yeah, and you can find my writings on Forbes. You just look up like my name, Roger Huang, Forbes. You'll find uh, my latest. Really cool. Perfect. And I see you in, in two weeks at Adopting Bitcoin in El Salvador. I will also be there. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw, you, just got I saw you just got added. So I was like, oh, yeah, Robin's going to be there. Um, <laughs> yes. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually going to be, yeah, we can, um, I don't know if you're still recording, but yeah, like, do you, did you want to talk like outside of the recording or? Oh, no, no. I, uh, um, I, I still didn't do my, uh, my, my end routine. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, like it's, 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 uh, with, with some guests, it flows. The energy is so good that, that like it never really ends and the podcast keeps going. And, and a lot, I love that a lot, but like, I'm, I'm like, oh, like it, at some point I should like end, end the yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. but maybe I, I turn into like a show wrong format at some point where i'll just like keep going for four hours i don't know uh, <laughs> right now i don't have the energy to talk four hours per day with a daily bitcoin podcast <laughs> like that, that would be a lot you got like amazing stamina like i'm doing this is like i do like i think like two or three media interviews like a week and i'm already like dead i have no idea how you're able to do like two like i've seen you do two in a day uh, yeah, the day I uh, had also two. Uh, I, actually, most recording days I have two or three because I don't record on Sundays and I do take breaks. So <laughs> I do have to record. Uh, when I record, I usually record two or three. Uh, in really rare cases, four. But that's that's yeah. uh, too much uh, and it fries your brain. And the last one is just not as good as it is. Three, I kind of can like three is good two is perfect uh because 
yeah, two, like there's no problem with that at all. Uh, the, the previous one was also long with one and a half hours. So I'm like today, three hours of podcast recording and yeah, my, my brain feels good. Uh, my brain feels fine. I hope, it's, <laughs> I hope it's not just for me. I hope it also, uh, you, you noticed that. <laughs> I'm not fried. I don't know. Hope, no, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah, I see you chugging the big uh, stein of like water. I'm like, wow, it's a very, very Austrian thing to do. <laughs> that, that that is that that is the the thing that keeps me going. Like just like liters of water every day. It's not vodka. Uh, so like there's actually just water in there. <laughs> I mean, if it was vodka, that'd be even more impressive. But um, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, that's that's also something I should bring to people. Like, yeah, drink water. Water is important. I, absolutely. Perfect. Then let's conclude. Thank you so much, uh, Roger, for being on. Thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.